So the first question is, if I alter my genome, I may alter those of my kind, of my kids, sorry. It's difficult to read. Why have I the right to make such a choice with potential side effect for them? So look, these are, these are difficult questions. And we have to take them seriously, right? We, in, in a very polarized political environment, you either get a political campaign that says, no, 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 or yes, 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 or you get a television show, even better, with two people yelling at each other. And it makes for good television. But these are complicated questions, and there's about a thousand shades of gray in how you answer that question. Because the first question you have to ask is, why? Right? And, and there's two very different levels. So if I'm an adult and I'm making a choice to alter my own gene code and I'm fully consented, I'm okay with that. If I'm an adult and I'm making a choice for my kids and for their kids and for their kids, that's what's called germline engineering. And that's a very different question. But of course, it's a very different question if you say, I want my kid to be taller than it is, I have Huntington's disease, I know I'm gonna die of Huntington's disease, my mother died of Huntington's disease, I don't want my child or their child to have Huntington's disease. Or I'd like my child to have resistance to AIDS. Right, so there, there you have to ask what are the alternatives and how safe is it and why are you choosing to do that? And, and each generation and each country and each faith are gonna come up with very different answers to this. But I hope it's not just yes, no, I hope it's a more nuanced answer. So 25% of us seems awfully like a brave new world by Aldous Huxley. How can we avoid the pitfall of his dystopian view? So look, some of this stuff is scary. Right? Some of this stuff keeps me up at night. But when stuff scares you, I want you to understand that it is normal and natural to be scared by the next generation. There's a topic which some of you may occasionally think about, which is sex. Just occasionally. The room gets very quiet when I say that. Right? But just imagine a conversation in the living room with your great-grandparents when they were about 18. Right? So somehow you come back and you explain sex to your 18-year-old great-grandparents. And you tell them, you know, when I live, sex does not equal baby. And they're going to go, what? Yes, see, we have these little pills. So you have sex and you don't have a baby. And they would have gone, what are you talking about? That's completely unnatural. And then you would have said, look, because I'm finishing my PhD, I chose to freeze my eggs, and I'll fertilize them later. So not only have you separated conception from sex, you've separated conception from the body. And then because you have cancer, you explain to your great-grandmother at age 18, oh, by the way, I have fertilized eggs, they're gonna be put into a surrogate mother, and therefore, I'm going to have fraternal twins born in five years, 50 years, 100 years, and each twin is going to be able to tell the newborn what they learned over the last 50 years. So you've separated sex from time. And we consider that completely normal and natural. We think it is perfectly okay. And it was the same thing with Louise Brown. The polls in the UK the day before she was born were 70% against, as soon as she was born, the majority was for that procedure. So we have to be a little humble in what we know and how we're gonna react to stuff and how quickly we become used to stuff, which doesn't mean we shouldn't be vigilant. So where does the law stand today on human genetic engineering in the US and in Europe? So there's a, a patchwork of stuff that's happening and a lot of the stuff that's at the leading edge it's not even being discussed yet, right? In, in the US, which is sometimes a very primitive political society, they're still arguing over reproductive rights of women. It's just galactically stupid. 
But as you're thinking about that, one of the things that's been put in place in Europe, which you have to think about carefully, is a precautionary principle. What is a precautionary principle? If you have a new technology and you show me it will not harm human beings, I'll allow you to do it. What a great idea. I mean, who could possibly be against an approval process that says, show me it won't harm people, and if it doesn't harm people, you can adopt this new technology. But unpack that principle a tiny bit. Under that principle, would I be allowed to build a staircase? Because staircases hurt people. Would I be allowed to have an electric plug? Would I be allowed to have metal? Would I be allowed to have salt? And some of these regulations that sound reasonable end up killing industries, making nations uncompetitive, and hurting people because they don't get the treatment. So in some parts, some of the medical approvals, some of the instrument approvals, Europe is far ahead of the US. And in other parts, it may be driving some very talented kids away to found their companies elsewhere. And that has a real cost. So maybe some of these new medicines are scary, maybe we don't know how long or how they should be approved, but you have to look at two sides of that. On the one hand, a medicine can have side effects. On the other hand, if you don't have a specific medicine, you may kill a lot of people. So if you take three extra years to study it, you may be killing a lot of folks. So 25% of the world should remain organic. How do you select them? For your own children, which child would you volunteer to go to? So how do you select them? I think that's up to each nation. I think different nations have different things that they love and respect. And I think each nation should make up its mind in the same ways we make up our minds about natural parks. And which one would I live in? I don't want to live in an all-natural, organic world. I don't think many of us should live in those all-natural, organic worlds because, among other things, you'd have your lifespan, at the very least. What risk of having some divergent gene pools that some people cannot have children together? One of the hardest questions that you can ask a biologist is what is a species? Even Darwin in The Origin of the Species couldn't really answer that question. There's at least 19 definitions today of what's a species. One of the traditional ones is two animals that can't breed together. But that's gotten really complicated, right? Because all of a sudden, you've got ligons, and you've got this, and you've got that, and you've got that. So you have example after example after example of animals that you thought couldn't breed together that actually can. And it now turns out that all of us have Neanderthal in us, 2 to 4% Neanderthal. So it was dark, it was lonely, there was a cave. Hey, it happens, right? Now, they do tell us that the percentage of Neanderthal is higher in some politicians than it is in normal humans. But the fact is that all of us interbred with what we consider to be another species, and then they found this part of a knuckle in a small cave in Siberia just, a, just less than a decade ago. When they ran that through a gene sequencer, they A, found a new human variant, a Denisovan, and B, they found that about 4% of the gene code of people in Southeast Asia comes from a species we didn't even know existed. And last week, they found that there was another ancestor that interbred with our ancestors. So it is normal and natural to have many human beings on this planet. It is normal and natural to interbreed with things that we consider another species. And this is going to be an interesting question, an interesting debate going forward. What is a species? Is there divergence in species? Thank you, Ron. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much.